something weird is happening on the moon. Scientists on Earth have spent the better part of the last decade trying to explore the moon with high-tech autonomous vehicles, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on a new generation of lunar landers, and for the most part, all we really have to show for it is an ever-expanding junkyard of broken spacecraft littering the surface. That is the problem, but there could be a solution. It's just going to come from a place you might not expect. We begin in the past. The year was 1967, NASA's Surveyor 3 spacecraft touched down on the surface of the moon. It was an autonomous robotic vehicle that was being used to set the stage for the Apollo missions. For the time, it was high-tech equipment, but in hindsight, the lander was using a flight computer with the power of a scientific calculator, and it was not a smooth landing either. But that was then, and this is now. In June 2025, a Japanese lander named Resilience approached the moon. This time, nearly 60 years later, the spacecraft is loaded with advanced computer systems, microchips, and a laser altitude scanner that can measure the exact distance to the lunar surface down to fractions of a millimeter. Again, it was not a smooth landing, but this time was far from successful. Resilience smashed into the moon hard enough to leave a crater 16 meters wide. The company who built the lander, iSpace, blamed the laser rangefinder for causing the crash. It was supposed to start measuring the distance to the moon at an altitude of 3 kilometers. Instead, it didn't kick in until the vehicle was less than 900 meters above the surface and still traveling at a speed of 66 meters per second. Once the computer figured out what was happening, it tried to slow down, but it was far too late. One theory as to why this happened is that the surface of the moon was less reflective than what was anticipated, so that reduced the amount of laser light getting bounced back to the lander and confused the whole system, tricking it into thinking it was higher up and not activating the landing engine. What's interesting here is that Surveyor 3 had a similar problem with an opposite result. It actually found that the surface of the moon was more reflective than expected for the lander's radar altitude sensor, which also confused the onboard computer. Only this time, it didn't happen several kilometers above the ground. Surveyor was actually just a few meters away from the moon. All it had to do was shut down the main engine and fall gently to the surface. Instead, the overwhelmed calculator just sort of froze up and couldn't figure out how close to the ground it actually was. So instead of just shutting off the rocket for a soft touchdown, it kept running, which caused Surveyor to bounce off the surface and fly 11 meters back into the air. Then it came back down again with the rocket engine still burning and bounced off the surface a second time. And on the third time, it either figured out where it was or ran out of fuel but the engine finally shut off and the lander came to a rest. Surveyor 3 had bounced so far off course that it ended up on the sloped edge of a large crater. But aside from that, the mission was a success. Now this is the kind of thing you'll hear often. How is it that NASA was able to land on the moon six decades ago with the computer power of a pocket calculator, while here in the 21st century, we can't seem to pull it off? Well, it is possible that our nostalgic vision of the past has a tendency to cloud our judgment. We misassociate good luck with superior engineering, but it's just as likely that we set higher standards for the present day because we expect more from people. And to be fair, not every modern moon landing has failed, but most of them do. Continuing with iSpace as an example, that wasn't even the first time they crash landed on the moon. They had a similar yet opposite problem in 2023. This time, the laser worked just fine, but it was the vehicle's computer software that got confused. And again, this is a problem with altitude. The lander thought it was coming in for a nice, soft landing just above the surface and shut down the main engine. In reality, it was still 5 kilometers above the moon. The spacecraft dropped like a rock. It's almost like the moon is somehow resistant to measurement or something. It's kind of weird. And it's the kind of thing that a computer on its own, no matter how powerful, is going to struggle with. We've got another failed moon landing in 2025 that might lend some more clues. This time, it's an American company, Intuitive Machines. And much like iSpace, they are making a second attempt at a lunar landing, which is also relying on a laser to guide their spacecraft. 
the intuitive machine's lander ended up on its side in the bottom of a crater at the lunar south pole. It tipped over not because it's shaped like a refrigerator, although that probably didn't help, but because the vehicle came in too fast and was carrying too much forward momentum. So it wasn't just going down, it was also moving sideways at a high speed. So when it hit the surface, it kind of tumbled end over end a few times before coming to a rest. Just like many times before, the lander got confused about how high up it actually was. The CEO of Intuitive Machines later said that the laser altimeter experienced, quote, signal and noise distortion that did not allow for accurate altitude readings. So two failed moon landings in 2025 from two wildly different companies who both experience a nearly identical problem. And not only that, but it seems to be indicative of a bigger problem that the moon has been causing would-be robotic explorers for decades now. Or is it? Because at the same time, there have been perfectly successful lunar landings, as many people would love to point out. We put a man on the moon, several of them, but that was different. While the Apollo landings did have autonomous systems, they were incredibly basic, like we talked about earlier. So the best insurance policy against a computer failure was to give the human pilots manual control over the vehicle. This is what NASA planned for. Every lunar module pilot trained on Earth in a full-scale, rocket-powered flight simulator. Now this thing was dangerous, it nearly killed Neil Armstrong, but it was considered essential that the men knew how to handle their spacecraft without reliance on computer navigation, and it worked. Every Apollo spacecraft landed perfectly. They weren't always on target, but they were never bouncing around up there either. So we have two methods for landing on the moon. One is the good old-fashioned human brain, equipped with eyes, ears, and instinct. We know this works. Two is a computer hooked up to a bunch of measuring devices like sensors and altimeters. In theory, this should work better because it's all just numbers and calculations. There's no room for human error. But in reality, these systems make plenty of errors. And they don't learn from them either because these problems keep repeating themselves for one reason or another. And what it all really comes down to is the fact that the moon is weird. It's unpredictable, and as close as we are to this thing, we really don't understand it. We are trying to take equipment that works on Earth and assuming that it'll work the same on the moon. It doesn't. This is why human landings have prevailed. We are flawed, but we are adaptable. When things don't go as expected, we figure it out. And borrowing a little bit of that human ingenuity is how we will eventually succeed on the moon, even without a person in the driver's seat. 2025 has been a big year for moon landings, and as much as we can learn from failure, we can also learn a lot from success. In March, the Firefly Blue Ghost lander successfully reached the surface of the moon, and it used an interesting method to get itself there. Blue Ghost was equipped with many of the same computers and sensors as any other spacecraft, but it also had something unique, an artificial intelligence-based navigation system. So the same way that Neil Armstrong landed on the moon using his eyes and his military pilot training, this AI did something very similar. Just like Neil, the AI had access to measurements for velocity and altitude, but also, like a real pilot, it didn't blindly trust the numbers. The most important pieces of equipment in Blue Ghost Landing were cameras, its eyes. The vehicle saw the moon, identified a safe landing zone, and then maneuvered down to the surface based on that visual data. Just like a pilot, the artificial intelligence had been trained in countless scenarios. It learned from failure, it studied success, and it drew on all of that to make critical decisions in the moment, no matter what kind of weirdness the moon threw at it. This concept is relatively new to spaceflight, but it's something that we've been doing for years with autonomous vehicles. Think of those driverless taxis from companies like Waymo, Cruise, and Tesla. Tesla is infamous for putting the heaviest reliance on cameras and AI in their self-driving technology. There was a time when Tesla vehicles were equipped with radar and sonar that provided exact measurements from the real world to the AI, but now that's been replaced with a camera-only approach. Except what a lot of people don't know is that Tesla still uses traditional measuring instruments such as LiDAR, which is a combination of laser and radar technology. There are plenty of images out there that show Tesla vehicles equipped with LiDAR systems that are being used to train and calibrate the camera vision. 
If this approach proves to be successful, then Tesla can use it to scale their autonomous vehicles at incredible speed. But they still face a problem when the AI gets confused and doesn't have any measurements to fall back on. The car tends to make weird and even dangerous choices at an unexpected moment. And this ultimately could hold them back. Likewise, when it comes to Waymo, which is owned by Google, people think that they don't use cameras and AI just because the vehicle also has that giant spinning sensor array on the roof. But that's not the case. Google is a world leader in artificial intelligence, and Waymo uses a combination of AI vision, along with measurements from LiDAR, radar, and sonar. This approach has allowed the company to get an early foothold in the driverless taxi market thanks to the higher reliability from combining modern AI with established technology. You get the best of both worlds. This is an approach that should probably be adapted to space exploration. It's easy to get hung up on trying to replicate the past and not fully embrace the modern day. It's also indicative of how slow moving the spaceflight industry really is. Most of these new vehicles don't take advantage of cutting edge AI because they were designed many years ago, before the algorithms even existed and the companies involved are too reluctant to adapt and make changes on the fly, if that sounds familiar. If you listen to the people in charge of iSpace and Intuitive Machines, you hear them talk a lot about shareholders and investors and patting themselves on the back for a job well done while their lander is in little pieces scattered across the moon. It starts to sound kind of insane. And then you have Firefly, a private company focused more on results than capital, riding the cutting edge of technology and succeeding. Of course, Firefly is hitting the stock market this year and everything could change. And again, we could be misassociating good luck with superior engineering, but we've got three moon landings, two failures, and one different approach that led to success. So what do you make of that?